Uh, I have no major disclosures to make with respect to this uh, presentation. And I would like to start with hemodilution by itself. And if we look to the impact of um, hematocrit and cardiopulmonary bypass in patients who actually are being non-transfused, apparently we can see that the impact of this uh, hemodilution is important. Interesting, however, is that we very often are focusing on the priming volume and saying this is the main impact of hemodilution. But I would disagree because I think, as we have seen also in the previous lectures, for example, the type of cardioplegia, crystalloid versus blood cardioplegia, has a major impact. But also the amount of volume given before cardiopulmonary bypass, and you would be surprised in some centers how much of this fluid is given, can be a magnitude higher than the total volume given by the bypass system. So if we look in these non-transfused patients, then you can see there are two important factors. One of them would be the initial hematocrit. If they have a high initial hematocrit, then most likely hemodilution will be relatively acceptable. But the moment that the hematocrit is going down, like in this case below 40, and then the nadir hematocrit during bypass, of course, also will be lower, in this case below 8, 28, you can see there is an increase in those patients of morbidity and even mortality. So being that we have to be careful on how we look at hemodilution. And of course, we have the big male and we have the small female. And we have to realize that this also has an impact because it means there will be a huge difference in blood volume. And for example, if we take this as an example, then you would see if you have the big person, he has something like four and a half liter compared to 2.6 liter in the smaller one. So meaning in this big one, if you would have 400 ml difference in priming, and I think these are acceptable volumes, you remain very well above this critical value shown as being 28. But if we go to the smaller, then you can see that even those 400 ml brings you in the zone of some consideration. But if we would take the same patients, and this time they would have an initial hematocrit of 33, then the picture becomes completely different because now you see that even in the large patient, we have difficulty in obtaining this minimum value. So meaning we cannot exclude those external factors to the total amount of volume as given as a priming volume. And we do know that hemoglobin or hematocrit is actually an important impact. The lower you go, the higher seems to be the morbidity. And there is some debate on what is the critical value because it will depend on the temperature you're working on, the flow you're giving, and so on. But what is quite clear is that if you look to all uh, publications actually looking at the impact of anemia in the uh, perioperative phase, then you will see that there is a negative effect as you go lower and lower. So meaning it's a point of consideration and we really should do and try something to do about it. What could be the background? And that's an interesting part. Probably the background is that we actually create a diffusion limitation at the microcirculation, meaning that if you have anemia, there is a rather long distance you have to, the, for the oxygen to travel to the tissue. And at the same time, because the lower viscosity will reduce this functionally capillary density, so there will be less of these capillary which will be open. And this means that if we have a diffusion limitation caused by hemodilution, this normally will give you a higher rate of morbidity. And then the big question is, how do we solve it? Of course, we can try to reduce priming volume, and I will address that in a minute. But the other solution is for many people, well, we just transfuse them. Because if we have no other solution, it's simple, we have the availability, we have a lot of testing of this blood, so maybe it could be a good solution. Unfortunately, if we look to the impact of anemia, on complications, then you can see it increases complications as shown before. But if we look to the complications related to transfusion, they are also not minor and sometimes even exceed the, the rate of complications uh, created by hemodilution. Meaning if you actually use then transfusion to compensate for the deficit you create with uh, the hemodilution, actually the results are worse. So it seems to be that it's much wiser to control hemodilution from the beginning than actually trying to control it in a later phase. And this was very nicely shown in this publication. As you can see here, they were looking at patients with a certain hematocrit which were transfused or non-transfused.